Once you master the understanding of mono and stereo as it relates to your music production, you're going to be able to produce tracks that are wide and deep. This is going to enhance the listener experience and elevate your tracks to a higher level. In order to properly understand these concepts, we're going to go back to when they were first developed, understand monophonic then stereophonic, and then we're going to understand how we can use mono and stereo sounds in combination in our tracks to, like we said, elevate your tracks to a higher level. Monophonic is broken down into two words. Mono meaning one or single, and phonic which means pertaining to sound. When we're dealing with a monophonic recording, we're dealing with one channel of audio. And if we were to send that one channel even to multiple speakers, they've only got one set of information that they could all play, so they'd be playing the exact same thing back. When we move into stereophonic, stereo means solid and phonic is pertaining to sound. And the name suggests that the spatial and dimensional aspects of a stereo recording and stereo playback creates a more solid or lifelike experience for the listener. Stereo is dealing with two channels of audio. And the way it works is mimicking the way that the human ear naturally hears sound in the environment. We pick up with our different ears slight variations in timing, volume, and frequency, which when processed by our brains, determines directionality of a sound. And so when the speakers play back audio from a stereo recording, that's effectively what's happening. They're manipulating the intensity or the volume, the timing, and the frequency content. The arrangement of different sounds across those two channels of audio can create a virtual stage, which we refer to as a sound stage. And so instruments or sound sources, they can be placed in different positions on this virtual stage by adjusting their relative volumes and timings in the left and right speakers. This placement gives the listener a perception of width where sounds seem to be coming from between points between the two speakers or even beyond them. If we want to bring a sound to the front of the soundstage, we make sure that we bring its volume up, we make sure that it's got a good amount of high frequency content, and we make sure that it's got very little reverberation on it. If we want to push something to the back of a mix, or the soundstage, we would lower it in volume, we would roll off high frequency content in the sound, and we would add reverberation to it. So in our toolkit, we have mono and stereo sounds to put into our tracks when we're producing music. And if we want to capture audio from the real world and we want to capture it in mono, we just use a single microphone. If we want to capture a stereo recording, we would use two microphones in a stereo configuration, which is going to be capturing two channels of audio. Now, we can also synthesize a stereo sound using a synthesizer, um, either an analog or a digital synthesizer. If we're completely inside of a digital audio workstation, we can create a, a mono sound or a digital sound with the synthesizers that we use. And we're going to look at what effects we can apply to a mono sound to make it stereo, but we're also going to take a look at how we can make a stereo sound into mono and what destructive effects can occur when we're taking something that's stereo and we're summing it into a mono signal. In order for you to get the most out of these demonstrations, I advise you to either be sitting in front of a great pair of stereo speakers where you've got them set up so that you really get a good stereo image, or you are wearing a pair of headphones. Now, ultimately, your ears are what matters, but what I am going to be showing you is some visual references as well so that you can visually see what's happening as well as hear what's happening and this combination of visual and audio information will hopefully help solidify these concepts to you but when I'm talking about looking at something please just understand that ultimately you need to hear what's going on you can't just look at what's going on. I've got a mono recording here in orange you can see that there's only one waveform here when we look at a stereo sample, there's two waveforms, one for each channel. And so 
if you just visually want to really quickly tell in Ableton whether you're dealing with stereo or mono recording, that's how you can tell. Also, something to note with Ableton and a lot of other digital audio workstations is they don't discriminate between an audio track that is for a mono sound or an audio track that's for stereo sound. So any audio track that you make in Ableton can accommodate one or the other and it's automatically set up and routed in the correct manner. Let's have a listen to the mono sound. This is my voice. It's my voice. And it should sound like it's coming from right in the center between the two speakers. If I go ahead and play the stereo sound that I've got selected here, it's not so defined in the middle. It bounces around on the outside or in the space between the two speakers. It is quite wide. Um, but it doesn't feel so much in my space that it goes beyond the width of the speakers, but some sounds absolutely can with the correct stereo treatment. Now, I've got a utility plugin. Um, most digital audio workstations should have something like a utility. And basically, what this allows us to do is change the volume, change the panning, um, and change the, the stereo width settings. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this sound mono. So... I go ahead and click that and I play it again. And now the sound is stented in the center like it was when I played the mono sound of my voice recording. And so we're able to collapse it into mono. And so if we wanted a very quick way to collapse our track into mono when we're producing something, we would just simply take utility. We could put it on our master channel and then we just turn this on and off when we want it to be mono. I've got a track here in front of me that I'm gonna use for the demonstration. I'll go ahead and play it for you. We have some stereo elements already in the track, such as the lead element, but we are gonna apply some more stereo winding to some of the other effects. So the clap that we've got here has a bit of stereo going on. I'm going to make it even wider. And I'm going to use a technique known as the Haas effect. And all of these stereo widening techniques work on a pretty similar principle. They take the audio and they'll create duplications of it. And those duplications then have time offsets applied to them. And this makes them have the perception of being wide. So here's a demonstration of it. I'm going to go ahead and enable the automation. And you'll see my automation, it's only turning on on the main clap. So for these little claps beforehand and in between, the stereo widening's not being applied. But have a listen to this. I'll deactivate it. And turn it back on again for you. And now I'm gonna play it inside the mix. I'll deactivate it and reactivate it. It makes this clap sit really nicely inside of the mix. We could come to the hat that we've got here and we could use another effect. This is known as a flanger effect. I'll turn it on. And you would have heard this before on things. It creates that really spacey kind of effect. I'll go ahead and change it to a flanger. Uh, sorry, a phaser. It's a similar kind of sound, a bit different. And you'll notice that they're kind of, it's moving around. So there's an LFO that's changing the time relationship that's making this kind of spacey sound occur. And the spacey sound is actually phase cancellation. What's happening is frequencies, when they're shifting in time, they're overlapping in various ways and resulting in cancellation, which I'll give you an example of a little bit later in this video. But for now, we'll keep this flanger on and we'll play it in our track. I don't know whether this flanger really works on this element, but I'm just giving you a bit of an example. So the clap's got the Haas effect applied to it and the hat now has this flanger.
what it is doing which could be perceived as quite nice is it's creating a subtle variation on this hat if i just play it without the flanger it's static it's always the same the flanger creates some movement in it and i could actually pull the dry wet down so it wasn't quite as exaggerated i could even change the rate of the effect so that it moves slower over time what this actually ends up doing is because it's moving slower over time that change over time is more spaced out and this actually works really nicely for um, constantly creating an interesting change to the listener so they don't get bored of listening to an element if we did that on a rate of two the listener will get tired of hearing that quicker than if we had it on a rate of four because the change is happening over a longer period of time so our ears are listening to that change for a longer period of time before it starts getting repetitive we come to the shaker i'm not really doing much with the shaker this is it without any effect on it and i'll turn this utility on and you'll notice that it sort of just gets lifted out a little bit so all I'm applying here is some additional width using the utility plugin. We've got this dial here. I've just brought it around to 195. That seemed like a pretty good value. And so with all of those effects at play in our track, here's what it sounds like. I'm zoomed in nice and close to a waveform here, the bass that we were looking at in a previous track, right? And these are more or less the instructions that are getting sent to the speaker in order to create the movement of the speaker to pressurize the air so that we can actually hear the sound. And there's a center line that you can see that runs through the middle. And then the amplitude of the signal moves negative and positive of that center line. And it moves around a little bit, but more or less it's going down, then it's going up, then it's going down, right? What we can imagine is when it's coming down, the speaker cone is pulling back. And when it's moving positive, the speaker cone is moving forward, okay? So this is the vibration that occurs from the speaker to pressurize the air. So phase cancellation is something that I'm going to show you how it occurs using this baseline. So basically, we've got this moving um, and oscillating in this manner. And maybe before I describe how we're going to make it happen here, I'll quickly tell you about how Bluetooth headphones noise cancellation works because it applies exactly to what we're doing. When you're using Bluetooth headphones that have noise cancellation in them, they have a microphone inside of them. And what that microphone does is it listens to the outside environment. And any noise that it picks up from the outside environment, it receives, it hears, and then it actually plays that audio in your headphones. But it does something to it. It inverts the phase. And so what that means is that when the waveform normally is moving down, then moving up, then moving down, what it's doing is it's taking this waveform and it's flipping it. And actually, I can give you an example of that. I'm going to use a utility, and I'm going to invert the polarity of the left and right channel using these buttons here. And I'm going to go ahead and freeze and flatten that track. And you can see that we have just flipped the audio on its head. Okay? So now, this piece of audio, which was identical to the one that we listened to, when its, its cycle is starting going into the positive and then into the negative, which is the complete opposite of how it's occurring on the original sound that we listened to. And so these waveforms are now completely flipped on the head. And if I listen to them in isolation, if I listen to the first one, sounds normal. If I listen to this one in isolation, sounds pretty similar to how it did before. 
But if I attempt to play them together at the same time, we don't hear anything. This is because they cancel each other out. And that's how active noise cancellation in your headphones work. And so phase cancellation is a form of this. This is like a complete cancellation. So we don't hear anything at all. But it's unlikely that in your tracks, when you're stereo widening things, the problem's going to be this dramatic. It's, it's very unlikely, in fact, that it's going to be that dramatic. So you're getting partial cancellation. And I'll give you a bit of an idea of what that sounds like by using a recording that I made of my voice. So I've got my voice here, uh, and I'm just saying something stupid, like... This is the sound of my voice. This is the sound of my voice. And I've got a delay that I've put on it here. And the delay is being automated in time. So it starts at one millisecond. It's going up to 21 milliseconds. Maybe we'll just do it like over a smaller period of time. Very, uh, very like small change in the timing, right? But what that's doing, if I just explain it one more time, is that the left channel is not moving in time. I mean, it's delayed by 1.5 milliseconds, but it's really not doing anything, right? And the other channel is just over that period of time, slightly getting offset, right? And it sounds like this. This is the sound of my voice. And it sounds very similar to the flanger or the phaser that we were using earlier. Metallic and kind of weird sounding. And you'll notice if you listen to it that at times my voice kind of sounds like it's getting a little bit hollow at some parts of the frequency spectrum and then it's getting full again in other parts, you know, like it's kind of shifting where it feels full and where it feels thin. That is phase cancellation. So there is frequency, there are frequencies that are overlapping in a similar way that what was happening here and they're canceling each other out. And so we're losing some sound. But also at times there's some that doesn't cancel out and even gets amplified a little bit and gets a little bit louder. And so this is what's happening when we feel that kind of rolling effect in my voice. And just out of interest, let's go ahead and chuck a utility on the end of that. We can use a utility to collapse everything down into mono so that we can hear what's happening when this gets summed back to a mono signal because we're making it quite actually let's talk about that this was originally a mono recording because i've only got a single microphone here we've made it stereo with this effect and now we're going to collapse it back down to mono let's have a listen to how it sounds this is the sound of my voice so you can see that or you can hear that it's in the center uh between our two speakers and it still sounds metallic and weird, but it doesn't have any width to it. And so when we've collapsed this down, we don't have the stereo width, but we have the cancellation. And so this effect is giving us something interesting when we're in stereo, but it is giving us something that sounds a bit strange when it's in mono. And so that's what you need to be aware of when you're creating stereo tracks that could be nice and wide, the result, when they're summed back down to mono, could be that certain parts of it are being destroyed. Let's see what happens with this track when we sum it down to mono. I'll grab a utility and I'll just put it after my limiter and everything. And I'm going to make it mono. I'll turn it back to stereo. So you definitely get a sense for the fact that the track is just way more immersive when it's in stereo. But what I was listening for was any crazy sort of cancellation that was occurring. And I didn't really hear anything too significant. I am listening on a very low volume um, and not being all that analytical about things. But I didn't hear anything that was super obvious. So let's play it again. I think the thing that's most obvious to me is that that bass actually has quite a bit of width to it and it really kind of sounds strange when it's pulled into the center. But that is how you can 
check whether your tracks are working properly in mono versus how they sound in stereo. And that's it for this video. I hope that this was really helpful and useful to you. And I'll see you again very soon in another video. Thanks.